I'm Coach Mickey, and I'm so glad that you've joined us. And if this is your first time joining us, come on in and make yourself comfortable. For those of you that join us on a regular basis, I'm so glad that you do. And I look forward to hearing from each and every one of you. And thank you so much for reaching out to my guests. They love hearing from you. And thank you for supporting them. And today, as usual, as you guys know, I love to find guests that have got an interesting story that are fun, full of adventure. And I am I have been looking forward forward to having on this guest today. So I'm just going to tell you a little bit about him like we always do. We'll just jump right in. Uh, Captain Ross Roberts, he is the author of Unlearning to Fly, Navigating Turbulence and Bliss of Growing Up in the Sky. Uh, he flew the Atlantic alone in a single engine plane, sailed the Northwest Passage. Uh, he's the youngest licensed flight instructor in United States, and he shared a VW bug with a moose and blew up his backyard. <laughs> so, welcome, well, <laughs> Dr. Ross nice. Roberts. How are you? Very well, thank you. It's nice to be with you, Mickey. And I hope I am that, looking. Uh, so we're just going to jump right in. First of all, um, I want to talk about. Yeah, you're becoming the youngest licensed flight instructor. Um, and, and as uh, my guests have heard, my circle of friends, as we, I call them, they know that I'm I'm a pilot helicopter. Uh, but I love having on pilots because we have such great experiences. So I really want to hear your story right from the beginning. When I found out you were a pilot, I knew this was going to be an easy conversation because no matter where you go, if you're with a pilot, you instantly have something to talk about. So. <laughs> This is true. This is true. So uh, let, let's just start. Well, you have, I mean, you've been around planes since, my gosh, since the beginning of your life. So let's just, let's just jump in right with that. Yeah. My, I, I've always wanted to be an airline pilot uh, since the, since before I could remember. As a matter of fact, the first memory I have on earth is doing a loop in an Aronka champ when I was three years old with my father. So the first memory I have on this planet is being upside down in an airplane. And uh, so it's, airplanes have been a, a, just the thread that has woven my life together. And never since I can remember, I wanted to be an airline pilot. So long story short, I wound up getting my private license on my 17th birthday. And between the time I was 17 and then 18, be able to get my commercial license, I discovered a loophole in the federal aviation regulations. They talked a lot about having the flight experience uh, to be a commercial pilot, but they didn't talk about age when it came to getting a flight instructor certificate. So I took the written test and I made an appointment at the FAA and uh, went down and, oh, so you want to get your CFI today? Yeah, that's right. Okay, well, looked at the looked at the paperwork and said well everything looks great but wait a minute how old are you i said i'm 17 well you know you have to be 18 to get a cfi i said well you know that's what i thought too but can we look at the regulations a little closer it's, oh no you have to be 18 okay we'll take a look and they found that there was no stipulation that uh, you had to be 18 years old to get a cfi a certified flight instructor certificate so uh, we took the test and he sent the paperwork off to the FAA headquarters in Oklahoma City and said, well, I know this is going to get kicked back, but they couldn't find uh, they couldn't find a regulation either. So I wound up being a CFI at 17 years old. I love it. That's great. <laughs> now, where where were you? Where are you located when you start, first started to fly? When I first actually started to fly. I was in Orange County, Virginia. My parents had uh, taken over the operation of the Orange County Airport. Perfect for me. And uh, so I began flying, taking lessons from my father, who was a CFI. I started taking lessons at 14 with him. So that's where I actually started flying. So you've been around this your whole life. And, and it's just because that's just been your whole lifestyle to be able my to. My whole life. Yeah. Yeah. In my book, I, I start out at the very beginning um, talking about my, my father was a mechanic for Capital Airlines, which was later absorbed into United Airlines. So he was a mechanic at uh, Washington National Airport. We lived in Northern Virginia at the time. And he wanted to be an airline pilot too. He wanted to be an airline pilot almost as much as I did. Uh, so he was hanging around getting his uh, licenses and uh, he was learning to fly at Beacon Field just outside Alexandria. 
And he was hanging around with all the airline pilots he could find. So they became fixtures at our house. And for me, that was like living on Mount Olympus, uh, living with the gods at parties. And uh, I remember Bob Smyrno, for example, a Capital Airlines pilot, and Captain Al, a Capital, uh, Capital Captain, was at our house a lot of the parties. Some of those are described in the book. But uh, yeah, I've been around airplanes and pilots my whole life. So these... These guys uh, kind of set the tone for me early. Gave me well, gave me direction. Crazy, uh, interesting group of guys to be hanging around. But as as we know, though, when you get around other air airline pilots, there's always a story. There's always information. You just have a lot. There's a camaraderie. There's a camaraderie about pilots. Uh, you know, like being up in the air is just an incredible adventure in itself. Um, so having that opportunity as young as you did, and then becoming a flight instructor had to have been such an, an incredible, not only accomplishment, but just a gift in everything that you've done, you know, throughout your life, having that start. It was a gift. And, you know, you were talking on one of your episodes with Nick Spark, uh, the episode about Poncho Barnes. And uh, he, he you, you were both talking about that, how we're in around pilots, there's always a story. And he pointed out rightly that oftentimes, I think he was talking about um, Chuck Yeager and uh, and uh, the air show pilot, uh, oh, my memory. It's okay. I don't remember his name either. <laughs> You're good. <laughs> yeah. It'll come up about 10 minutes later when we're on to something else. Um yeah, how how sometimes when you're with the pilots, you know, it's they can't. If you say, "Hey, tell me about," oh, I don't remember. It's these stories that sort of just rise up out of out of the ether that they're that are so precious. And if you're not with them, if you're not in company with them, you know, these stories will never be heard because they're not going to write them down. Or, you know, these are just things that happen. But the the stories can be amazing. I remember. Uh, we had a restaurant at our at our airport in Virginia, and we'd sit around the lunch counter, and I'd get the guys to tell me about their flights. Uh, you know, we'd use salt and pepper shakers as the terrain in our hands as airplanes, and I'd make these guys go through every detail of of the flight that they were describing. What was the weather? What was the engine doing? You know, what how did you feel? So you know, we were we were dissecting the the flights, and it, it just does such a rich rich place for for especially a young person so what's one of your favorite stories i mean because you've got a lot of flight hours and you must have a couple like what's the ones that stick out in your mind that just seem so dear to you well there are so many and uh, i well the one i start the book with is is one that is um you know sticks with me i was ferrying a that means delivering a uh, single-engine Cessna Cardinal to Europe. It was my first solo transatlantic trip. And I was wondering why I was out there in the first place. We launched, I launched out of, we, I always say we, it's me in the airplane. Launched out of Pennsylvania and uh, flew up to Goose Bay, Labrador. And from there, I was going to fly nonstop to Iceland, get more fuel. We had uh, ferry tanks on the airplane, which would be extra tanks. So I had about 24 hours of fuel on the airplane, which was an extraordinary fuel load. But, uh, I took off off out of Goose Bay and everything was fine for a while. The weather forecast was okay. But then the um, clouds uh, that were supposed to be layered uh, became one mass. And I found myself flying in the clouds below freezing. So naturally, the airplane's wings began to ice up. And uh, so I said, oh, this, is a, this is a nice fix. And uh, I tried to climb to a different altitude to find uh, clear air. And that didn't work. I got up to the airplane's maximum altitude. It would no, no longer climb. It was so heavy. I said, well, the only thing we can do is go down, find, maybe find some warmer air down below. So about that time, as I was descending, I got into the worst turbulence I've oh. had experienced before or since. The airplane was... Well, I describe it as being in a terrier's mouth. It was just being thrown around violently. My head, even though I was in the shoulder harness and seatbelt, and my head was banging against the ceiling and my shoulders up against the door. And it was really tough. And I was wondering, you know, I put faith in the engineers and mechanics who built the airplane that they had, uh, they had done the work. And sure enough, nothing broke. And uh, 
airplane uh, survived and so did I. And it was funny because uh, as we got below the cloud layer, I realized the turbulence was gone and the airplane was fine and I was fine. But what had happened during that turbulence is that uh, we had a, uh, they call it a wet compass. It's just a normal compass that is on top of the instrument panel. And it's, uh, it floats in a, in a bath of, of liquid to keep it damp, its mo motions damp. It. So uh, as we were in the turbulence, the uh, compass card, the thing that tells you what direction you're going, jumped up off of its peg and wedged itself in the corner, no longer to move. Which proved to be a bit of a problem because earlier I had lost my directional gyro, effectively lost it. It was not functioning properly either. So here I was in the middle of the Labrador Sea, at least three or 400 miles away from land with no way to tell what direction I was going. So that was an interesting situation. Below the clouds like that too, I couldn't uh, see the sun. I couldn't get a bearing on the sun, no land to look at. So yeah, it was just, that was an interesting, uh, interesting fix. But obviously, uh, things work out. I'm talking to you. Yeah, it, it's amazing because there's other things that you learn as a pilot. Um, and even for myself as a, as a skydiver, you, I've had situations where everything else is, you don't have it available anymore. And you have to go to the most, well, I, I don't want to say primitive, but think about it. People have used the sun, the wind, um, and other elements to be able to get your direction. And, and for you to come out of something like that, I think the scariest thing is the frozen wings, because that you have no idea. And especially then put turbulence on top of it. Uh, yeah, that's pretty exciting. <laughs> that's pretty exciting. Yeah, I mean, you just use what you have, don't you? You just... Um... You just, you know, you don't have this anymore. What what do we have? What do we have left? Let's use this. This this should work. And it worked out fine. I was able to get a bearing off of a radio station somewhere. I don't know where it was initially. And uh, okay, well, the direction finding needle on the radio is pointing. I'll just maintain that bearing. And that it worked out. You know, eventually I got to Greenland. And of course, it's more, I detail it quite a bit in the book, but uh Got to Greenland, was able to fix the compass and went on my way. That's a heck of a solo. I mean, it really is for a solo trip. My gosh. I mean, good for you. Um, yeah, the weird thing is, you know, I was 25 years old and I was immortal, you know, I, at that age. And I wound up doing nine more of those solo uh, transatlantic trips after that. That's awesome. Uh, mm. Speaking of navigating, I want to talk about you sailing the Northwest Passage. I had an opportunity to listen to some of your video that you sent me through that YouTube when you were speaking at that museum. And uh, I, I caught part of the story, but I'd like to, to touch on that a little bit because you've lived such a life of adventure and, and going from, from the air to sea. Um, I think a lot of those cross over when it comes to navigating. Um, but yeah, I would like to hear that story. Yeah, you know, Alan Alda on his great podcast about uh, communication and science always asks a question as listeners at the end, what is the book that most influenced you in your life? And for me, it, uh, I thought about that. It was uh, Thor Heyerdahl's uh, Contiki Across the Pacific by Raft. I've always been interested in sailing and of course airplanes since the very beginning but once i saw gregory peck in uh, moby dick and then watched uh, watched the documentary of uh, contiki I, uh, the ocean and sailing in particular just uh, held me held me tight and uh, i remember being in the third grade and i was having trouble reading i couldn't read i had i think there were seven different teachers in first grade, which didn't help us, you know, it didn't just help the continuity in the reading department. But for whatever reason, by the time I got to third grade, I was just not reading. I was faking it. And uh, I thought I was faking it. We went to the library one day, and it was about a week or two after I'd seen the documentary Contiki, and I found the book in, uh, in the library. And uh, Mrs. Brimsmaid was my, was my teacher, and she said, uh, Russell, don't you want to check out a book with more pictures in it? I said, no, I really want this book. She said, well, that's a mighty big, thick book. I nodded. 
And the librarian was looking over her half glasses at me and knowing that Russell couldn't read that book either. I said, no, this is the, this is the book I want to take home this weekend. And, uh, you know, it has pictures in it. There were some photographs in the middle. It has some pictures. And they kind of shook their head. And, well, Russell went home with that book. And I, I literally slept with it for the next... It just meant so much to me to have this this book, you know, this hired all telling this story. It had written these words down. It was it was nice to see the documentary, but to have this book, you know, it just and and I have to say that's the book that had most had the most effect on me. So anyway, the sailing thing started there, and the Northwest Passage. Well. Of course, I'd read all the stories about uh, Amundsen and. Uh, and uh, John Franklin uh, and all the early explorers in the West for the Northwest Passage. Well, I was off work. I was on leave for some time and was cruising around. I was sort of shopping for a sailboat myself and ran across Captain Eric Forsyth's uh, website. And he was uh, seeking to try the Northwest Passage for himself and he needed a crew. So I uh, emailed him. I said, you know, I can, I can hand reef and steer. You know, I'd like to come with you at least for you know a part of your trip. I can give you a couple of months. And he said, well, come on up and meet me. English fellow, you know, he was a uh, engineer, electrical engineer that worked at the Brookhaven National Laboratory up in New York. But he uh, said, yeah, come on up and uh, meet me. We're having a party, a going away party, and you can see the boat and let me know what you think. So I did. I drove up. He showed me the boat, met some of his friends. After about five minutes of this, he said, well, are you coming with us? I said, well, yeah, sure. I can give you, you know, like I said, a couple of months. So, you know, it was about three weeks later, I met up with him in Greenland to tackle the Northwest Passage over the ice-choked waters of the Canadian Arctic. What was that like? That had to have been an experience. It was cold. We... uh I joined the boat in July 2009 in Greenland, and we, uh, Eric and I became experts on how to read ice charts and predict where icebergs might be, you know? but it was cold. It, it was about maximum 40 degrees Fahrenheit, 4 Celsius, uh, and we spent most of our time out on deck looking for ice and I was, it was, I was on board for seven weeks and wearing practically all the clothes I brought. And my pervading memory of that trip was the cold and how tired we got. But it was, yeah, it was an adventure. I mean, you look at a globe and you, you think, man, that's way up there. I mean, you're practically, you know, we, at one point we were only 900 miles from the North Pole in a 42 foot fiberglass pleasure craft. So, yeah, it was an interesting experience. The cold. Eric did have a furnace on board, but uh, it had the heat of uh, like a Christmas tree bulb. There wasn't a whole lot of BTUs coming out of that baby. Did you get an yeah, opportunity no. to stop and meet any of the um, Inuit people while you yes. were traveling? Yes. One of the things that we were experiencing in the summer of 2009 in Baffin Bay. We started in Nook uh, in Greenland. It used to be called Godhab, but the uh, Inuit uh, word for the town is Nook, and uuk That's where I joined the boat. And incidentally, that's also where I had landed in that Cessna Cardinal to fix the compass. So it was like the kind of a full circle coming around. So this time I was going to be leaving Nook in a, in a fiberglass sailboat. Anyway, we took off and we were noticing there just wasn't a whole lot of wind. Only about ninety, uh, about ninety percent of the time, we were having to motor, burning diesel fuel. So uh, up the, we were going to go nonstop to uh, uh, to Resolute in the middle of the Canadian archipelago, but we realized we weren't going to have the fuel to do that. So the the nice thing about that, we were able to visit two of the Greenland towns way up north. Uh, we stopped at Susimiut and got fuel, and uh, then we essentially motored on up to Upernavik, which was our last fuel stop in Greenland, and then shot straight across the northern part of Baffin Bay into the heart of the Northwest Passage in Lancaster Sound. So, uh, 
yeah, dodging ice and learning how to predict where it might be. But uh, it was it was an exercise in fuel management for sure. Well, from the stories you're telling me, it seems like you always have this experience with ice. Have you ever gone or sailed any place warmer? <laughs> you know, I yeah, some, I think that might be the first time that I've realized that. Yeah, over the Arctic like that and the little airplanes on the sailboat. Yeah, well, it was a story of ice, wasn't it? Yeah. <laughs> That's yeah. so funny. Uh, yeah, well, for some reason, I uh, found myself in the northern latitudes a lot. Uh, I had talked to you just a few minutes ago about, uh, you know, Orange County Airport in Virginia, and then uh, my dad working for Capital Airlines in northern Virginia. Well, between northern Virginia and back in Orange County, my folks decided to move to Alaska. So in 1960, they hauled uh, my sister and I and our mother, and my, my parents hauled, hauled the two kids up the Alaska Highway in a Volkswagen Bug to resettle in Alaska. My dad thought that uh, the uh, wilds of Northern United States might uh, hold more promise for a flying job. So that's where he went on a, on a open prayer. And we wound up spending seven years there. So maybe that's where my, uh, maybe there's something that got embedded in me and I, I kind of was craving the Northern latitudes after that, who knows? I love Alaska. Alaska is beautiful, and I have to give credit to Alaskan bush pilots because I've seen some of those guys and gals land in some pretty crazy areas, especially some of the, the glacier pilots or, well, the bush pilots. You know, I've had an opportunity. I've, I go up to Alaska quite often, oh, and I good. love it up there. There's just something about it. it it's, you either love Alaska or you don't understand it, and, and Alaska just kind of gets in your soul. And there's just a part of Alaska that's just amazing. The people, the culture, um, the just the wildlife, like you said, which leads me to this next question because... I got I to gotta hear the story of how you shared a VW bug with a moose. And I'm sure that was in the Alaska aspect of your life. <laughs> it was. Uh, my father went there to build flying time in hopes of then getting an airline job somewhere back in the lower 48. So while in Alaska, he became a bush pilot, flying Cessna 180s, airplanes like that, uh, some Super Cubs out in the bush. He never flew on floats. You know, there's so many bush pilots who are... Uh, float plane pilots. My dad was always a land, land-based uh, pilot, but uh, well, the moose story. We traveled to Alaska in a 19, I think it was 1959 Volkswagen bug. Everything we owned was uh, on top of the bug. Oh, well, we got to Alaska and ascent, initially there was no job no good job for him in, in Anchorage. So we resettled uh, almost right away in Fairbanks. So one weekend, there was no flying going on. And my dad decided it would be a great time to take the kids up to the Arctic Circle to go up to Circle Hot Springs and see what that was all about. Neither of my parents realized at the time that Circle Hot Springs was actually 65 miles south of the Arctic Circle. So the kids weren't going to get to the actual line anyway. But never mind, off we went. I think it was about 100 miles from Fairbanks to uh, Circle Hot Springs on a gravel highway. So apparently, from my point of view, the only thing they packed for the day trip was a cooler of uh, sodas and, and beer and um, maybe a few sandwiches. And so we took off about three quarters of the way up there. I was flying my hand out the open window of the, of the car. Have you ever done that, Mickey, where you, when you're a kid, you stuck your hand out the window of the of the car and you flew it? Yes, you, I still did do you ever do that? <laughs> you can, you can, you know, as a kid, I, I discovered what flaps were for. I'd bend my hand a certain way and I, you know, I can make my hand fly. And anyway, that's what I was doing. Fly my hand out the window, not paying much attention on the car. I noticed my airspeed was reducing on my hand and my air couldn't develop. The car was slowing down. My dad had shut the engine off and put it in neutral and just kind of glided to a stop. And then he reached around and from underneath my feet took his 300 h and h magnum rifle out and slowly opened the door and, I, and then i looked out the front window and there was this big bull moose standing right in the middle of the highway everybody was dead quiet in the car so he took a beat on it from behind the door kerbam 
the moose looked kind of surprised, crumpled right in the middle of the highway. So now here we were, so I think it was two o'clock in the afternoon, in fall, so the sun, sundown was coming soon, fairly soon. He had a thousand pounds of moose in the middle of the road. Like I said, there was no preparation for this this uh, day trip that I could see, but he had he had his rifle. Next thing I know, he opened up the front of the bug, you know, that's where the storage, that's where the trunk is on those things. He took out a knife, he took out an ax, he took out a saw, and he commenced to butcher the moose in the middle of the highway. That went on for hours. And oh, he also had visqueen, you know, that's plastic sheeting, you know. So he's able to wrap the meat up as he butchered it. He'd wrap the meat up in visqueen and stack it up. Well, it became nighttime. And uh, it got really dark. So he positioned my mother in between the front lights of the bug. Said, okay, honey, if uh, here's the shotgun. If you hear if you hear a bear coming up on me, shoot it. She hadn't touched a gun in years. So. And I was kind of worried that she would get excited and maybe shoot my dad. And that's, it was an interesting situation. Well, sure enough, a little while later, there was a rustling in the in the bushes, and everybody thought there was a grizzly coming. And all of a sudden, a great horned owl flew over top of us. And wanted a little bit of the moose. So, fortunately, my mother didn't have to didn't have to apply her marksmanship that evening. Well, eventually we got everything packed up. My dad had everything packed pretty well, except for the hindquarters, the rear legs of the moose. There was no more room. He had been packing the bug. Every every part of the bug, the passenger compartment, the trunk, the rack on the roof had moose wrapped up in it. And uh, so uh, no hindquarters, couldn't fit them anywhere. Well, fortuitously, the only vehicle of, of the entire day came rumbling by with a guy with a flatbed truck. He stopped. He says, well, you folks need any help? Well, my dad says, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to leave these hindquarters behind you. Could you, could you throw them on the back? Oh, sure. I'll throw them on the back of the truck. Here's my address. Come by in the morning and pick them up in Fairbanks. So, you know, it just, it seems there's always, there's always help when you need it. Well, meanwhile, so we're ready to go, and Dad um, said, well, let's drive on back. I said, what about the rack? What about the antlers? You're not going to leave those behind, are you? I started crying. I said, you know, no hunter can leave the moose antlers behind, and he's, oh, we just don't have room for them, son. My mom looked at him, and next thing I know, the axe and the saw is coming back out of the bug, and he's whacking away at the antlers and got them and stuck them somewhere, tied them onto the bug. And so from then on, you know, I had moose antlers uh, over, over the door of the house. If I could remember that day. It was wonderful. But in the, in the bug, you know, we were, my sister and I sitting on, on wrapped up packages of bloody moose. And you can imagine the smell. It was horrendous. That way, our little our little head, you know, we weren't that tall, but our heads were banging against the ceiling because there was that much moose we were using for seats. And my dad was, from time to time, was rather unusual. So that's the story of the moose, Mickey. That's that's interesting. Well, you know, and again, for for my circle of friends that listen, if you if you have not been to Alaska or if you are not hunters, you have to understand that in that area, um, everything is used. Everything. I mean, because it gets so difficult in a lot of areas of Alaska. And I was asking you about the Inuit. <clears throat> You know, because I had an opportunity to go up to Barrow, Alaska. Hmm. And when I was up in Barrow, they, as a, as a culture and as a community, every, they use everything. I mean, because they're at the top of the world, they're right at the end of the, um, is it, is it the Bal it's Baltic Sea? It's up there. Is it uh, that one? Beaufort, the Beaufort Sea. Yeah. And uh, so they're, but they, they, I mean, between the, the, furs and the meat and they use everything for fuel so um i like the fact that at least your dad had a, he knew what to do and then i'm sure you probably were eating moose for for the rest of the year because that's a lot of meat <laughs> moose and caribou you know we acquired a caribou also and uh yeah 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 absolutely they use everything that's one thing when i when on the northwest passage on the 
uh, as Eric called it, the Yacht Fiona. When we um, got to Resolute, it, as I described it in, in, the, in the talk that you saw, um, it looked like Resolute was built on a uh, in a gravel pit with a dump. I mean, the whole town looked like that. Just everything, you know, you never can tell when you might have to use this old bit of uh, snow machine or washing machine, you know, everything is saved. You never know when you might find a nut or a bolt or a fan belt or so they keep everything and it looks terrible. And the whole town smelled like I finally realized it sounded like a it smelled like a uh, 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 open graveyard for mice, you know, that dead mouse smell. Well, the whole town smelled like that because they had seals that were being used for dog food. They had bear hides. They had um, they even had some whale parts there and just left out to kind of rot. And um, but it, it, so it acquired this interesting aroma. My mother pointed out years before in Fairbanks. So she said, yeah, the place looks awful. But then when it snows, you know, in the winter time, it's dark and it's also, everything's covered in three feet of snow. So in winter time, it all becomes quite beautiful. Have you been there in, in winter? Yeah, I've never been in the winter. Um, I've been to Fairbanks. I've been up to Fairbanks. The the I usually go during the shoulder months. Uh, yes. So I'll go like in May or or sometimes August. You know, right. they're still getting snow. But the um, yeah, it's it's just, like I said, it's a different lifestyle because it's not like here. It's not like in the United States where you. I mean, down here in the lower forty eight, where you're like, okay, you know, I can just run over here and get this. There's miles, sometimes hundreds of miles, especially between Anchorage and Fairbanks. You you take um, was it the Parks Highway? There's nothing yeah. there. You might get maybe Talkeetna is there, and you got a couple little towns, but you you're not going to Home Depot. You're not going to the grocery store. It's it's a different lifestyle. Um, so right. I can understand why if you've got something, you're going to hang on to it and, and, you know, utilize it. But isn't that what we do as pilots, though? I mean, we've always got things that we might need because you just never know. You know, I, you, you always right. have some kind of bag, you know, that you're taking with you because you just never know what kind of situation you're going to be in. Like you said. That's exactly right. When the old airline pilot, Bob Smyrno, I mentioned earlier, came up to visit us from Virginia, he rolled into Fairbanks one day went out to the airport and rented a Cessna 172 to take just a short ride around so he could see the, get the lay of the land. He had only been airborne 10 minutes. He landed and said, I got to get some equipment. So, you know, he went to the hardware store and they had everything he needed, you know, a tent, an ax, made sure he had a gun with. He realized right off the bat, if, if he went down in the 1960s uh, Alaska, there was a chance he would, He'd just be lost. And there were every year up there at that time, there were pilots who had got never to be seen again. I don't know if you, have you ever heard of Ben Eilson, Carl Ben Eilson? Mm -hmm. He was an early pioneer. I think he was the first um, real bush pilot in Alaska, uh, pioneered airmail service up there. Fascinating story. He came up from Minnesota. He was a school teacher landed his airplane in the ballpark there in Fairbanks and started an air service. And he had, there's so many stories. There's a wonderful book you might enjoy. Uh, Gene Potter wrote it. It's called The Flying North. And it's all the stories of the early bush pilots, Ben Eilson, uh, uh, Noel Ween, uh, people like that, Archie Trammell, uh, guys that really pioneered. And that, that was I mean, that was the 1930s, by the 1960s, when my father was flying there, it, things had progressed quite a bit. But the, remember, even 1960, there were only two VOR stations in the whole state, one in Fairbanks and one in Anchorage. That's the, for then, the modern uh, VHF Omni range navigation station. There were only two in the whole state. Oh, there was gosh. no such thing as GPS, no there was no such thing as Loran or Loran C. I mean, it was basically just dead reckoning and pilotage and uh, weather forecasts were allowed. It, yeah, it was, it was still the Wild West even as late as 1960. Did you do any flying yourself up there? I had an opportunity to uh, fly a float plane. 
Um, oh. So we, we were out, we, I, I've got land up there and the only way, my land is very remote. And the only way to see my land is you have to actually hire a bush pilot and you go out there and we flew, we put in the coordinates and flew over and uh, just happened to be, we were flying in and he said, Hey, you want to make a pit stop? And we stopped at a friend, his, one of his friend's house, totally off the grid, landed on her lake and uh, stopped there, had lunch. She had this amazing garden. And then uh, she goes, he said, you want to fly? And I'm like, yeah. <laughs> so what I kind of airplane? Had, a, had an opportunity to, to fly back and fly back to Anchorage. And um, yeah. actually, no, back to, I was on the Kenai Peninsula. I was on the Kenai Peninsula because my land's in Nikiski, which is uh, a little bit down from, um, it's, uh, so let's see, I'm trying to think of, so Kenai is a little bit south of Anchorage, but it's off the, right. it's off the Cook Inlet. Um, yeah. But yeah. Prince William Sound is to the east, I think. Yeah. Beautiful. That's one of the most beautiful parts of the whole state. Gorgeous. What kind of airplane was it? You know what? I don't remember. I don't remember. It was so many years ago. I, I wow. don't, I remember just, because like I said, my thing's helicopters. And because I started with fixed wing, but then I went on to helicopters. Um, a lot of, uh, but like anything that gets me in the air, I'll do it. I'll fly it. Well, <laughs> you know, tell just, me about I mean, that. How, I didn't how... land it or anything. He just let me fly while we were up. <laughs> Unless you were a Vietnam pilot, you know, getting into helicopters is kind of unusual. Well, how, tell, tell me about that. Oh my I gosh. Did. So, um, I had, so I live here in Southern California and from across where I live is Catalina Island. And there's two ways to get to Catalina. One is to either go by boat, which is about an hour and a half, or two, you can get a helicopter and take it out of Long Beach. And I just said, you know, I'm going to do the helicopter. That'd be really fun. It's quicker, it's faster, and it'd be kind of fun. Hopped in. And so because I'm so light, and if you know anything about planes and helicopters, you have to distribute the weight correctly because so I'm light, I was up the front. And they had mm -hmm. everybody else in the back and there was three other people in the back. And I remember it was, I remember looking and I was watching and I was so excited to watch, you know, how he was working, you know, the cyclic and the collective. And I was watching the yep. pedals and I'm just, I was like so excited that by the time I got to Catalina, all I wanted to do was go back and take lessons on how to fly a helicopter. And so I did my thing at Catalina came back. We actually took the boat back, came back that way. I went right down to Oceanside. I actually was in Carlsbad and there's a place called Palomar Airport and uh, met a helicopter pilot that was there. He's from Germany. He was a uh, flight instructor. He was just trying to launch his business. And um, I said, Hey, I'll make a deal with you. My background is marketing and advertising. And he was trying to think, I said, I'm, you know, I didn't have the money then to learn how to fly because it was expensive to take lessons. Very. And I said, I'll make a deal with you. If you, if you will teach me how to fly, I'll market your business. And that's what we did. And we traded wow. off. We kind of bartered and he did. He taught me how to fly. I, uh, I learned to do a, a, a um, Robbie. Wow. So, and that's, that's what kind of helicopter did you start out in? Robbie. It was a, yeah. R22. The 22. Yeah, I was yeah. in a 22, Robbie 22. And I and I I loved it. And to, to be honest with you, I'm going to tell you, Russ, for me, um, I I have problems with my ears. And so I, for me, I want to always be stable because I don't like, you know, anything that's this twisty turny. So I give you credit for somebody who can actually do the loops and all that. And mm -hmm. the first thing I learned how to do was hover. And he's like, I've never seen anybody get hovering down. And because he'd take me out to this field. And I was just, and I was learning how to hover. And he was... He was a little on the crazy side, but that's what I loved about him because it made me a much better pilot. He's like, okay, I want you to, you're in this empty parking lot. He goes, stay on the lines on the parking lot, you know, going and you're here, you are just above the ground and you're, you're learning how to, to hover and, uh, and land on uneven areas. And I, I just, yeah. you know, as you can tell, I, I love it. I, I just, I love flying. It was, it was yeah. such an incredible experience. And, um, unfortunately he, he moved on to other things and, and I had moved away. But uh, like I said, there's something about being in the air that you um, you you just you just have to. It's just in your soul. You just you just yes. becomes part of. It. Like you said, the plane. You said we. Yes, because you become part of that equipment, and it's not. I it just beca becomes part of you. You know, whether you're flying an airplane, whether you're flying a helicopter, you're just. It's just you and that. You know that other entity that's exact, of you exactly in right whether that's an r22 whether that's a cessna cardinal whether that's an airbus a330 
same thing. You become part, you became, you become one. And I think that's where that whole we thing comes to it. You know, if it's just you and the, in the aircraft, it's still we, isn't it? Yeah. I agree. Yeah. I agree. Hey, we got a little bit of time, but I, because I mentioned it in the um, intro, I've got to hear the story of how you blew up your backyard. <laughs> oh, that's another, that's another of my yeah, father's stories. Oh, okay. I want to hear about you um, because uh, what are you doing now? What, what, what's going, what are you doing at this time? And I know you're traveling and you're doing a lot of speaking engagements, but if people want to connect with you, and of course, as everybody knows, all your information will be embedded into the podcast. You guys will have an opportunity to reach out and get, a, you know, uh, find his book online and on Amazon. And then also, um, but it, what, what, what's going on with you? What are you doing? Yeah. Yeah. Everything's uh, on the website there. There's a link, big post can send messages, uh, what have you. So yeah, um, what's happening? I retired from the airline uh, four years ago. And so um, I'm a retired airline captain now and uh, hanging out mainly in the Pacific Northwest. I'm here in my house in cent the central highlands of Mexico right now. So uh, doing that, I still have uh, still have airplanes. I have um, a little amphibian, a sea ray. Uh, incidentally, uh, you remember Richard Bach, the uh, author? wrote Jonathan Livingston Seagull. You recall that? Yes, that was one of my favorite books. I love that book. Well, Richard uh, owned this airplane that I have now, and he wrote a book about the very machine. It's called Travels with Puff. He named the airplane Puff, and in the book, of course, being Richard, you know, the airplane spoke to him and this kind of thing. I have to say that since I've had the airplane for almost three years now, it's never spoken to me, but there you go. You never can tell. Anyway, I have that airplane, and also... In the book I describe in Alaska, my father bought a Luscombe aircraft, a little two-seater, which he subsequently, um, well, he wrecked it. And the last I saw, I thought it was my airplane, being five, six years old. The last I saw of my airplane, it left uh, on the back of a flatbed truck in the cloud of dust down Gridell Avenue in Fairbanks. Well, as I was writing the, the book, I was curious whatever happened to the airplane. I was able to find it it was still on the faa registry and i contacted the owner i said oh what's the story with the airplane long story short he said it's in a hangar it came with the property i bought if you want it you can have it so it didn't take me more than a week i went up and picked up the remains of the airplane and now that's being restored um, in missouri and we should have it well, i should have it finished there in the next six months or so so two little airplanes that are occupying my time and um uh, you know, traveling around, like you said, doing the Mexico thing now, which is kind of fun. And that's what I'm doing now, writing the next book, writing the sequel to the first one. So, I love it. I love it. Yeah. That is awesome. Well, I have had so much fun with you being here with me. And I, I love your stories. I love people that have take their passion and, and do so much with it in their life. And, and you definitely know how to, to live a life of adventure. And, and you know, I, I one of the things I was drawn to you was the fact that some people say, Oh, I wish I did, or I would like to, but you just took what you had and, and what you wanted and your passion. You said, this is what I'm going to do. And I'm going to do it. And you can look back on your life and, and still keep going forward with your life, doing so many wonderful adventurous things. And, you know, that's what it's all about, right? Is, is well, yeah, I like to say, you know, I'm not, I'm not an adventurer. I don't seek out adventure. What I, I like to, I, I kind of see myself as a collector of stories, a collector of experiences, you know, so. It's your over, adventure though. It's yeah. it's your life. It's your adventure. And, and not, you know, the stories that you have to tell and for what you've done, I mean, from, from flying to sailing, I mean, that is, that does take a lot of, uh, I mean, for lack of better words, it takes a lot of, uh, I don't want to say courage because, but it, but you just have to want to do it. You just have to. Curiosity. Have yeah. Curiosity. Yeah. That's. For me, that's it. it. You know, it's just what 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 lies over the next uh, you know next hill. What over what lies over that horizon? That's it. Curi I'm just I just I'm curious. Want to know what's next? Well, thank you so much for being with us. And um, again, I will put in all the links into uh, not only to the podcast, but also here on the YouTube. So you'll see them down below. And then uh, if this is your first time coming in, please, if you'd like to hear more of my guests, or if you have a suggestion for a guest, please let me know. You have all the ways to contact me. You can go to um, <clears throat> Coach Mickey and Friends, and that'll give you also some of our older podcast guests. But is there anything else you'd like to add before we wrap it up? 
Well, I just wanted to say it was a real pleasure being here with you. I wish we had more time to tell more airplane stories. And pilots <laughs> well, I'm going to have you back. That, that can go on forever, right? But uh, yeah. <laughs> But uh, yeah, I, yeah I, I really enjoyed my time with you, Mickey. Thank you. Same here. Thank you. I definitely want to have you back when you have your next book. All right, you guys, Great. thank you so much for being with us. And I will look forward to seeing you next time. Until then, most oh, oh that's on this side. Most courageous thing you can do is be yourself. Um, until then, I will see you. Bye. <laughs>